and uh, it, it has haunted me ever since. It haunted me. The, you know, the, the prospect of it ever happening haunted me, and, uh, and the fact that it did happen. And it's, uh, it's always with me. Looking simply at the cars that were twisted the way you would take a piece of paper and twist it, uh, and at the way, uh, you know, concrete slabs were pulled from, you know, their pinnings, and, and uh, you know, a board driven seven feet into the ground and, you know, splinters through glass. And, and then you think of what happened to, uh, you know, the pliant bodies who were in the, you know, in the way of these missiles that were coming at them. And it uh, was a living, breathing thing in Jackson all these years later. Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Carly. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone who came out to the live stream on Tuesday. We had a lot of fun putting up this tree together and this other smaller tree. I don't really have too much to preface with today. If you want to follow my social medias, I do have a Twitter and an Instagram account. If you want to keep up with me on a more daily basis. With all of that being said, let's just get right into it. On March 3rd, 1966, one of the longest track F5 twisters in American history would move over 200 miles across the state of Mississippi, becoming one of the most devastating and deadliest tornadoes in the 20th century. This is the story of the Candlestick Park tornado. Wednesday, March 2nd, 1966. A large mid-level closed low centered over South Dakota is progressing eastward across the United States. In the upper levels, an unusually strong jet stream curving out of the south. Combining those with winds between 40 to 50 knots at the surface level, moving in a slightly different direction, there's now the presence of wind shear, or turning with wind in height, a key element in tornado formation. Moisture is surging northward from the Gulf of Mexico, and the ingredients are now becoming more favorable and conducive to what could be a tornado outbreak in the southern United States in the next 24 hours. Forecasters do know at this point that severe weather and storms are possible for the next day, March 3rd, but without the technological advancements in radars and forecasting equipment, Local meteorologists are predicting the chance for some scattered storms across central Mississippi for the next evening, but no real mention of tornadoes. People aren't exactly on high alert for a high potential tornado day back then as we would be now. It's really business as usual for the residents of central Mississippi. Thursday, March 3rd, 1966. As early as 6 a.m., soundings are beginning to show high moisture values creeping up into the southeast, with roughly 1,500 joules per kilogram of cape in central Mississippi by the early afternoon hours. And what's interesting is that despite the fact that there's this incredibly ripe atmosphere for really what could have been a major tornado outbreak, there's a capping inversion in place. By the afternoon hours, storms that would have normally been able to have developed are effectively being hindered by this cap and not able to form supercell thunderstorms, so not much is really happening. But this doesn't last forever. Something's about to change. Around 1 p.m., a warm front moves through portions of the southern United States, allowing for even more warm, moist air to move into central Mississippi. And while this atmospheric cap did prevent a majority of what really could have been a major tornado outbreak, there was just enough leeway for one singular discrete storm to break through the cap and to take root in central Mississippi. 
Unlike most of the twisters or outbreaks that we discuss on this channel, what I find to be the most fascinating part of this event was that it was neither preceded nor followed by any other tornadoes. Oddly, the Candlestick Park Twister was essentially the only tornado that spawned from this entire very powerful low pressure system. Almost as if every piece of energy the entire atmosphere had to lend went to this one singular storm. It's business as usual for the residents of Jackson, Mississippi on March 3rd. It's partly cloudy and the sun has been shining for most of the day in central Mississippi. And despite the fact that we know that the sun shining on a potential tornado day is a very dangerous sign, this kind of weather is anything but alarming for the residents of central Mississippi. At three o'clock, people are getting off work kids are getting off of school or college, and many people have errands to run in the town. It's starting to be rush hour. At the same time, that one singular storm that has slipped through the cracks of the atmospheric cap is now a supercell thunderstorm, and it's very quickly taking shape and beginning to rotate in this increasingly primed atmosphere. All the violence that the atmosphere could give was lended to this one storm. And unbeknownst to those in Jackson, Mississippi, what would become one of the most violent tornadoes of the 20th century has just touched down. The infamous twister touches down in southern Hines County, comprised of largely rural areas near Dry Grove and Spring Ridge Roads. And despite the fact that it's not moving over any populated areas just yet, we know that these storms are devastating to rural communities. Single family homes and barns with people's businesses and livelihoods and family heritage are all things that are destroyed when we talk about tornadoes moving over rural communities, despite the fact that it's not talked about as much. While the twister is moving over the rural portions of Southern Hines County, the citizens of Jackson, Mississippi, a relatively busy metropolitan area in 1966, are in rush hour traffic. Jackson, Mississippi, the capital of the state, lies in the eastern portion of Hines County, and the twister is rapidly approaching before moving into the Jackson city limits in a display of the violent damage that was to come for the capital city, the twister plows down the Jackson television station's 1,900-foot broadcast tower before moving into Jackson and causing the most violent damage of its entire life. It's now 4.30 p.m. in Jackson city limits. In the southwestern portion of the metropolitan region, lies Candlestick Park. Candlestick Park was a popular strip mall, usually bustling with business in the afternoon hours, and virtually the center of town where people would go to do their grocery shopping, their clothes shopping, to go eat dinner, or do their laundry. It was really the gathering point or the social point for a lot of people in this tight-knit community in Jackson. Larry Swales was a 17-year-old working at the local grocery store known as Liberty Grocery in the Candlestick Park Shopping Center on March 3rd. And while most are certainly unaware of the tragedy that's about to strike, those on the western side of the city are beginning to suspect that something is going on and hear something in the distance. Larry goes out to put groceries in a car and begins to notice how eerie and still everything feels. What he believes are just rain clouds in the distance are particularly ominous in color and something just feels off. Minutes later at 4.33 p.m., a call is made to the local news station. Someone has just seen a tornado headed straight for Candlestick Park. Bert Case, the anchorman on duty at the time, receives the call and without hesitation, immediately goes live on air to quickly inform the residents that a tornado is headed straight for the center of town. 
As soon as I got the call, I went straight to the announce booth, as we had in those days. If you live to the northeast of Candlestick Park Shopping Center, take cover immediately. This is the only warning that the residents of Jackson would ever get. But for those in Candlestick Park Shopping Center, it's already too late. Witnesses near the shopping center can only watch in horror. There's really not much you can do but sort of see the whole thing happen and unfold right in front of you. One person claimed it was like 50 freight trains on the same track at the same time coming right for them. Larry Swales, the young grocery store clerk, said that the last thing he remembers before the twister hits was somebody frantically running into the front doors and yelling out that a twister was coming just seconds before it actually hits the building. As I made the turn to come out of the parking lot, uh, this young man came running down the sidewalk uh, and he was screaming, there's a tornado coming. Out of my curiosity, uh, I went up there and went to the end of the building and looked around the building and sure enough, there was a tornado. It was a huge tornado uh, accompanied by one or two little smaller ones sitting right behind it. And all that. So I immediately ran back inside and I started screaming to everybody get down the tornado and he's going to hit the building and we all right, need to take cover. In those last few seconds, customers and employees are literally running around trying to figure out where they would or could hide in an open grocery store. Some ran into the corners. Some would hide in utility closets, and some, without enough time to think or act, would still be out in the open in the middle of the grocery store as it hits. As the wind approaches, the doors to the grocery store open and slam shut. Larry remembers being dragged across the store floor as the winds of the twister finally start to hit the building. Fortunately, Larry, like many of the other customers, were either holding on to something or under some kind of cover when the twister hits. Larry was still able to see outside from his cover and recalls opening his eyes in the middle of the onslaught to see cars from the parking lot flying around like paper cups, as he described, swirling around the storm as if they were literally weightless. The imagery that comes out of the Candlestick Park Shopping Center give you a clue as to why the storm was not only immediately rated an F5, but why this twister was actually named after the shopping center. There's a picture that outlines where the businesses in this mall used to be. Those cars that were described as paper cups flying were scattered across the parking lot of the plaza, some even found up to a half a mile away. The center blocks that used to make up the shopping center would be found great distances away from the shopping center all across Jackson. A man named Luke saved himself by hugging a steel post supporting the building. He said that he watched the building collapse and miraculously somehow survived with only a cash on his arm. Another survivor named Jim Ward said he was saved only by the seatbelt that he was wearing when the twister picked up his car and tossed it like it was a toy. And a lot of the stories of survivors were people who were driving, again, this was rush hour traffic, and were picked up by the storm, many of which miraculously survived, of which is Donna Durr, who was inside of her Volkswagen bug with her infant son, which was lifted 75 feet up in the air. But she says it was, again, miraculously gently set down, and she and her son both survived without major injury. And this is really a testament to the fact that so many people had no clue that a tornado was coming. It really looked like a rain shower to them. 
so people were actually just driving right into this twister. The twister has been going on for well over an hour at this point, and despite having caused some of the most intense damage of its life over Jackson in Hines County and where the media attention would really focus most of its time, the Candlestick Park tornado wasn't done. After having moved through the rest of Jackson, Mississippi, flattening dozens of homes, farms, and businesses, including a glass factory that was mangled, and a 100-year-old brick Baptist church. The twister continues northeast, crossing Pearl River east of Jackson and into Rankin and Scott counties. This is where yet another swath of intense to violent damage would occur in the southern portions of the counties, including the community of Leesburg, where six more people would tragically lose their lives. One of the fatalities in Rankin County included a promising young candidate for Congress named Joe Bullock, who was taken up in his car and dropped. The Twister has been ongoing now for well over an hour at violent intensity over three counties in central Mississippi before moving into Scott County. It is suspected that the Twister was actually at its peak intensity in Scott County, Many believe winds likely reached in excess of 260 miles per hour here. And this is believed to be true because of, of course, the horrific damage inflicted to several single family homes in this region, particularly in portions of Forkville and north of Branch, where homes were pulled off foundations, trees were peeled, and eyewitnesses report that pavement on the road in front of them had been scoured. Even without homes in this area, because it is a little bit more rural now, expansive areas of mature trees were again stripped of bark and mowed down, which of course is indicative of extreme violence. And in the most tragic testament to just how violent the twister was at this point, 26 people lost their lives in Scott County points north. And it's at this point specifically where I want to note the biggest discrepancy of this entire event. Here's what we know. We know that in Neshoba County, the storm has been going on for an hour and a half and the twister begins to weaken down to around F2 intensity. That's a fact. But it's at this point in Neshoba County where some scientists believe the original twister actually dies off and a second new twister forms at F2 intensity. But without clear evidence and a detailed survey like we would have today, many still believe and the public record still shows that the Candlestick Park twister was a singular consistent tornado with one continuous damage path. But whether or not this was a singular tornado or two tornadoes from the same parent supercell, what we do know is that a weak tornado continues to move through Kemper and Neshoba counties, damaging over a dozen homes as it now moves from Mississippi into Alabama state lines. We do know that now at F2 intensity, there are several homes that sustain damage as it moves into Pickens and Tuscaloosa counties. We know that eight homes were completely destroyed and another 30 were damaged. Six barns were destroyed and another eight were damaged as well. And tragically, the twister would take its final life in the state of Alabama, a highway patrolman who lost his life in his home near Coker, Alabama. And finally, after a really unbelievable almost four hour journey and an over 200 mile path, the twister dies off at 7.45 p.m. north of Tuscaloosa, Alabama and becomes one of the longest tracking tornadoes in American history. The devastation in central Mississippi is unfathomable.
just quiet, so quiet. You know, you can uh, you hear people start calling for help and wanting, you know, just things happening. And everything from there on just was kind of a blur. I mean, you just started helping people and taking care of people. The two little girls that the neighbor had asked me to bring up there, she come running up to me and uh, she had had her uh, thumb was severed and, and was hanging on. And I took my apron off and I had it wrapped it up and everything and I rushed her outside for a mile. My mom was okay, believe it or not. She went through the storm pretty hard. We escorted everybody we could that we knew needed medical attention out to the road. And the guy had uh, racked up in his uh, camper truck. And i never forget, we were putting people in the back of the camper truck and everything. And he was loading them up to get them out of there to get them to the hospital. As night begins to fall, the realization of what's just happened in Jackson, Mississippi is slowly beginning to be realized. Deputy Sheriff Bob Fasano is in charge of search and rescue at the recently destroyed Candlestick Park Shopping Center. By just approaching what was left of the shopping center, the deputy sheriff fears the worst. After seeing a large mass of mangled debris and cars, he knows that the casualty count could be high. And of course, this kind of scene is as chaotic as you can imagine it would be. Volunteers and survivors, many of which are injured, some of which are gravely injured at this point, are doing everything they can to help those who are trapped in cars or under the rubble of the building. And one of the tragic parts about this search and rescue process specifically was that it was still raining so hard that a lot of the rescue operations done by police and fire actually had to wait. Deputy Sheriff Fasano in charge of this search and rescue operation said that with the amount of rain, the areas in the shopping center were effectively a swamp and they couldn't get themselves and a lot of the equipment in to the shopping center and there was little that they could do until dawn. Overnight, 12 people had lost their life in the Candlestick Park Shopping Center. The next morning, Friday morning, March 4th, the Lieutenant Governor visited the worst areas of the damage in Mississippi, later stating in a press conference that he had never seen devastation so horrible in his entire life. This official who was acting in the absence of Mississippi Governor Paul Johnson said that the state agencies would work as quickly as possible in responding to the needs of the most ravished areas to provide support and prevent the unnecessary discomfort of the citizens who lived in the path. This event was described by him as horrible beyond belief. There would be in total four twisters on March 3rd, 1966, three very tiny and short-lived F1 twisters, and of course the one monstrous F5, all of which were spawned from that one singular parent supercell that managed to break through the cap. The twister has an official path of 202.5 miles from central Mississippi into Alabama with a maximum width of 900 yards. In total, 58 lives were lost, 57 in Mississippi and one in Alabama with just over 500 injuries reported, which would rank this as the second deadliest and longest track twister in Mississippi state history. The twister ultimately cost $75 million in damage in 1966 dollars, which is roughly the equivalent of $620 million today. The recovery in the Candlestick Park Twister story is an interesting one because once again, we don't have a ton of information to work with. One thing I do know about the recovery process of this twister is that shockingly, the Candlestick Park Shopping Center was rebuilt four months later. Four months after the entire shopping center was ripped apart, it was rebuilt, which is utterly mind-boggling to me. And even more mind-blowing is that 
the Candlestick Park Shopping Center still exists today in 2022 in the same spot. They rebuilt it in the same spot and it has made it through decades and decades and is still there today. There's not much of any information at all on the rebuilding process of the dozens of homes that were flattened in the rural areas. I also could not really find any information on the industrial park regions that were hit, which is unfortunate. I would really like to find something. I did a lot of digging. If any of you have any experiences of parents or loved ones, or maybe you might have experienced something uh, from the Candlestick Park Twister, you know something about the area, I would be really interested in hearing uh, any of your stories if you have any because it just seems like there's a huge chunk of this story that's missing that was never really documented. For you literature lovers out there, I did actually discover that Ernest Hemingway's granddaughter, Lorianne Hemingway, actually had lived in Candlestick Park the month before the twister struck. She had lived there for a large portion of her life in central Mississippi and actually had moved to Nashville one month before the twister struck. Lorianne recalls that every single time she goes back to Mississippi, well into her adult life and decades later even, she will coincidentally hear people talk about the Candlestick Park tornado. She says it was never through any provocation of her own, but the topic would always just come up. Lorianne says she is really amazed at how much this twister has lived on and how much it's impacted people and become a part of their very history. Um, uh, barely a month, I guess, uh, before it hit, you know, we moved away. And uh, it, it has haunted me ever since. It haunted me. The, you know, the, the prospect of it ever happening haunted me, and, uh, and the fact that it did happen. Whenever I would go back, it would always be a subject that would come up um, unbidden. I mean, unprovoked. People would, would talk about it. I would hear people talking whom I did not know in a restaurant, say. And it uh, was a living, breathing thing in Jackson all these years later. It, it is still incomprehensible to me. I it always will be. I don't think that I'll ever, uh, you know, master the knowledge of, of physics or the spiritual or the divine to ever understand um, how that happened. Looking simply at the cars that were twisted the way you would take a piece of paper and twist it, uh, and at the way, uh, you know, concrete slabs were pulled from, you know, their pinnings and, and, uh, you know, a board driven seven feet into the ground and, you know, splinters through glass. And, and then you think of what happened to, uh, you know, the pliant bodies who were in the, you know, in the way of these missiles that were coming at them. Many people saved lives. He helped pull people out of the wreckage. Ronnie Hannes uh, did not perish immediately. He actually pulled himself from the wreckage after having saved the life of, of this little girl um, and helped pull bodies even though he was mortally wounded and, and carry them up to the road. Mm -hmm. There is a very clear heaviness that still sits or lingers on when these people talk about this event, in my opinion. Some of which were interviewed shortly after, some of which have been interviewed decades since. Lorianne Hemingway would go on to write a book called A World Turned Over, where she tells the story of the survivors, those who were injured and still helped others, and how the people overcame, and how the twister still haunts Jackson and the Candlestick Park regions. I did a lot of searching and I at this point, do not believe that this twister was ever surveyed in full, perhaps in Jackson. I was not able to find much of anything in the way of survey. However, there have been several reassessments of this storm done in the years since this event. One of the several reassessments was actually done by Tom Grizzulis, where he records it in his book, of course, known as Significant Tornadoes. In his entries of this event, it is actually listed as two separate tornadoes or a family of tornadoes. 
And I would like to play devil's advocate a little bit here. There is some evidence that does point to this being two separate twisters, part of a family of tornadoes, namely due to several eyewitness reports that were given and with the varying track reports, it does seem like there's a little discrepancy in what could have been the track. But because there is no other solidifying evidence, this twister is still officially considered to be one singular twister. And this certainly wouldn't be the first time and it won't be the last time that we question whether or not a tornado in the 20th century was a singular or series of multiple tornadoes. One of the biggest questions we still have about twisters in the 20th century is whether or not the infamous tri-state tornado was a singular continuous tornado or a family of twisters. I actually don't really have an opinion on this either way. I just want to present the information that's out there and let you know that there are some discrepancies on whether or not it's a singular tornado or not. And ultimately, we might never know. On the 50th anniversary of the Candlestick Park Twister, the National Weather Service did a If the Tornado Happened Today segment. I am not personally a fan of those kinds of what-if scenarios, but if you were interested in that, the National Weather Service did a segment like that. I just, to me, think it's a little common sense that if the Candlestick Park tornado happened in Jackson, Mississippi today, it of course would be a lot worse because naturally there's been a lot of development in the United States. The landscape of Hines and Rankin County has changed dramatically in the last 50 years. For instance, the stack wasn't here and much of western Rankin County was rural farmland. The developments like the Dogwood Festival Market and the Atlas of Mississippi did not exist back in 1966, and four times as many people now live in Rankin County. I will link that below if you are interested in the Weather Service's 50th anniversary special. You can check it out. Mississippi would have somewhat of a break from F5 or extremely violent twisters, for a few decades after the Candlestick Park Twister, the next F5 tornado wouldn't be until the 2011 super outbreak where, of course, two EF5s moved through Philadelphia in Smithville, Mississippi on April 27th. And in 2022, even with its discrepancies, the Candlestick Park tornado still holds the title for being one of the worst and most infamous twisters in Mississippi state history, along with the likes of, of course, Philadelphia and Smithville and the Great Notches tornado of 1980. I find this entire event to be really fascinating. I find it strange how there were really no other tornadoes outside of this one singular incredibly violent twister that sort of slipped through the cracks of the atmospheric cap. But I think you all know at this point, the stranger the event, the more I tend to like covering it. That's all I have for you all today. Thank you so, so much for being here. You can follow me on social media if you'd like to keep up with me on a more daily basis. And that's it. I will see you all in the next one. Bye. Mid level closed. Level closed low. Mid level closed low. <laughs> a large mid level closed. <laughs> Close low. That is not easy to say.